Can the, the other sites wave at us and tell us that they're okay? Yay! Everybody can hear us. Yay. Excellent. So we're going to get going. So if anybody has questions, um, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. Uh, we've probably got time at the end as well. Uh, we're just waiting for one person to just grab a bit of food and come in. Uh, so we're going to keep glancing down over here, which is you guys showing up for us at the other site. So if we keep looking to the one side, it's yeah, just because we're looking at the computer down there. So we're good. Oh, I've got a clicker. Excellent. Right. Well, thank you to our one captive audience member who's now come in, who's going to be lectured at by us. Um, and thank you to the other sites. So before we start, I would just like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional territories of the Songhees, the Squimalt, and Wasanic peoples here at our two sites in Victoria, and on the traditional territories of the Comox peoples in Comox Up Island, where Uta is. So my name is Jenny Cartwright, and I'm with the BC Support Unit, Vancouver Island Centre, which we're going to be talking about in a bit. Um, and this is my colleague, Tara McMillan. Which one of these is? Is it that one? Yes. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose, other than we are both employed by the BC Support Unit, Vancouver Island Centre, and we work at Island Health. Um, and acknowledgements to say that some of the content from this workshop was taken from Foundations in Patient-Oriented Research, um, which is a three-module course that the Canadian Institutes of Health Research has developed, and it is available through the BC Support Unit, and so some of this has been adapted from that. So workshop agenda. Well, arrival and lunch has happened, so we're going to go through some introduction and workshop objectives and some definitions about patient-oriented research. And then we're going to talk about the benefits and the value of patient-oriented research, uh, when and how to engage patient partners in research and some of the ethical and cultural competency considerations around that, have a bit of discussion on applying patient-oriented research, depending on how much discussion we can have with our three partners. Uh, we'll give you a bit of information about the tools and support that's available through the BC Support Unit, i.e. us. And then there'll be a bit of a discussion and a Q&A, &A, and then the Faculty of Medicine has an evaluation survey as well. Um, and there's also a workshop sheet, um, so there will be questions that come up during the slides uh, where they ask you to respond on your sheet to the answers, so that will come up too. All right, so we're going to start with an introduction, some workshop objectives, and some definitions just to kind of set the scene. Um, so some workshop learning objectives, which you've maybe already seen before. Um, we're going what is sorry, Tara, you have to come closer to the mic. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Taylor. You Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, much better. <laughs> I should have put the roaming mi the roving mic on. I said, no, oh, no, I'll stand behind the lectern. It's all good. Um, okay, thank you. Just jump in if I walk <laughs> too far away. Uh, so, okay, so we're going to start by um, talking about what is patient-oriented research, why um, it's valuable and beneficial, why should we bother with it. Uh, we'll look at some examples. Um, and how, when and how to engage patient partners in research. Um, some, like Jenny said, ethical and com uh, cultural competence considerations. Um, some opportunities, so try and figure out where you can put patient-oriented research into your, uh, into your practice. And then uh, we'll talk about what some resources are and, and who can help you out, which is us, with uh, patient-oriented research. Um, okay, so we'll start off with what do we mean by patient? Uh, it's kind of a loaded term sometimes, so um, especially in a medical context, often we think of the sort of a traditional patient, um, but in patient-oriented research, we really mean anyone with lived experience. So that could be a, a typical patient, or it could be their caregiver, um, the family, um, a community member, um, anybody really um, is a patient at some point in their lives in some some way. So that's really when we say patient-oriented research, we're talking about all of these things. So the four patient engagement frameworks so the strategy for patient-oriented research um, defines it as individuals with personal experience of a health issue uh, and their informal caregivers, including family. So what is patient-oriented research? Uh, so traditionally, patients have been the subjects of health research or study participants. So you think of a typical, like a clinical trial where um, people are being studied or you know, given the different treatments. And that's kind of been 
been uh, the traditional way that people have been involved in research. Um, but patient-oriented research um, is really research that's done in partnership with patients um, that answers research questions that matter to patients and aims to improve healthcare. Um, so the goal is really to use that lived experience pr perspective to make the research um, more meaningful uh, and, and that it can actually be rolled out into to improve practice. Uh, so if you were to look at a research study, how would you know if it is patient-oriented research or not? Uh, so you can look for a few different things. Uh, does it engage patients as partners? So are they actually members of the research team that have some say uh, in how the research is done? Um, a a patient-oriented research project will focus on patient-identified priorities. So this isn't a project that is um, just something a researcher was curious about and nobody else cares about that's going to be published in a journal uh, and sit on a dusty shelf. Um, it actually has to be something that's important to patients um, and that aims to improve patient outcomes, which sounds really obvious, but again, it is really important that, uh, that this research is actually actionable and going to do something. Um, it engages multidisciplinary teams in partnership with re uh, relevant stakeholders, so um, not just academics, but also clinicians, people with lived experience, policymakers, anybody who is uh, a stakeholder should be involved right up front. Uh, and really aims to apply knowledge that's generated to improve healthcare systems and practice. So um, it should go right from those patient priorities all the way through to making a difference in patient care. So what is patient engagement? Um, patient engagement means that patients are meaningfully and actively collaborating in one or more of so governance, priority setting, conducting research, or knowledge translation. So there's um, lots of different places in a research project that um, uh, patients can be, or people with lived experience can be involved, uh, whether they're you know, making higher level decisions, helping at the very beginning to decide directions, doing the actual research, whether that's conducting focus groups or helping with data analysis, um, or and or helping get that information out there at the end. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a local example here. Um, so this is uh, an example of a patient-oriented research project that happened here in Victoria. Uh, so this is uh, digital storytelling, bringing evidence-based treatment for C. diff infection closer to home. Um, so I'll go through this fairly quickly, but um, the, the goal was to increase this uh, fecal microbiota transplant access for patients who are diagnosed with a recurrent C. diff infection. So uh, it's a new treatment and the idea is to get uh, the information out there and increase the access. Um, so the idea was to develop a digital story that enables a patient partner to share lived experience uh, and to support researchers in relaying evidence. Uh, so you can see from the list of stakeholders that there were um, a really broad range of people involved in this, from uh, Dr. Christine Lee, who is a, a professor and a clinician, um, primary care phys uh, physician, Hannah Roy is a patient partner, um, and then a, a host of other people as well. And I think we've got, we've got the video here. I'm not sure how we're doing for time, but... Um, you think we're good? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna play the video for you. So, like a full minute. So. Yes. Yeah, so bear with me while we navigate this. And somebody jump in at one of the other sites if it doesn't work for you. Hi, my name is Hannah, and I am one of the 40,000 Canadians each year who have suffered from Clostridium difficile infection, also known as C. diff infection. C. diff causes debilitating pain and diarrhea, which can last from weeks to months. Recently, I boarded a plane only to hear an announcement that the washroom was out of service. I had a moment of panic. This was one of my worst fears. My life revolved around having access to a bathroom. Let me take you on my painful journey with Crohn's and irritable bowel syndrome, a journey that was complicated by C. diff infection. Along with being physically debilitating, C. diff infection causes pain and diarrhea. These chronic gut illnesses made my emotional and social life a turbulent nightmare. In school, I frequently had stomach aches that became more intrusive and robbed me of a lighthearted childhood. I had to complete many of my courses at home, socially isolated. I watched life carry on without me, and in my grad year, I felt profound sadness over missing out on lifelong memories. I have spent many years of my life in specialist offices, emergency departments, and hospital rooms. 
My four-year university degree took six years to complete. My emotional and physical health plummeted at times. In 2017, after multiple rounds of antibiotics for a suspected bladder infection, I contracted severe recurrent C. diff infection. I was hospitalized, faced possible surgery to remove part of my colon, and I had never felt so ill in my life. I wondered if I would survive this horrific infection. Turns out that my recurrent C. diff infection had a silver lining. I was eligible to receive fecal transplants through a research study. Fecal transplants, also known as FMT, is given by enema. It's a simple and painless procedure in which donor's healthy feces is inserted into my digestive tract. Some people may be grossed out by the idea, but I was desperate to get better. And research studies have found that FMT is 85% effective in curing recurrent C. diff infection. After two FMT treatments, my C. diff infection was gone. I still receive ongoing FMT treatments for my Crohn's and irritable bowel, and I am now pain-free and healthy. At 27 years of age, I'm in my final year of my nursing degree, what seemed like an impossible dream when I was ill. Becoming a nurse is becoming a reality. Soon I'll be able to pay it forward for the exceptional care I received from the FMT team, led by Dr. Christine Lee at Island Health. I am also paying it forward by using my lived experience of C. diff infection and FMT to inform FMT research studies. I am also sharing my story in the hope that more people will receive this life-changing treatment. Back on the plane, I remind myself that those fearful days are over. My life is dramatically and positively improved thanks to fecal transplant. I confidently sit back, enjoy the flight, looking forward to my future full of potential. All right. Okay, so yeah, this is a great example of how um, a patient um, had a really good experience and, and became a patient partner and, and really contributed to the research after that. Uh, and so this is a, a neat thing that's happening here in Victoria. Uh, so we're going to turn to the worksheet that you've got in front of you, and we'll give you a couple of minutes here. Uh, and we'll look at number one. So if you could list what you have learned about the definition of patient-oriented research and its characteristics. Uh, and it says I'm supposed to invite someone to share. So that could be um, <laughs> our one lonely person in this room, or it could be one of the other people in the other site. So uh, take a minute, and then uh, we'll come back in a couple of minutes here. people staring at me in all of the sites, so I assume that means everyone has had enough time to, to scribble down. Um, <laughs> would someone like to jump in and share what you have learned about the definition of patient-oriented research and its characteristics? Um, I think all you have to do at any of the sites is just unmute your mic, and then magically we will be able to see and hear you. Who's brave? Come on. Anybody? Go Yay, for it. Thank you. Go Uh, from Victoria, patient-oriented research I learned is research that engages patients and anyone with lived experience of 
an illness um, directly in any stage of the research or it responds to the patients and public's priorities for research or aims to improve outcomes for patients or improve healthcare services. Beautiful. Thank you. Awesome. You All right. Going? Yeah. Got it in one. Extra food for you. <laughs> Uh, okay, so just this last little bit here before I turn it over to Jenny, but to say that uh, in Canada we have the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research, or SPOR, um, which is about providing evidence to help inform development of health policies and improve the healthcare system. Um, and this evidence is really strong because it's informed by multiple stakeholder viewpoints, so that's why it's really important. Um, SPOR is a national initiative led by um, the CIHR, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, which is Canada's largest funding body. Uh, it looks a little different in each province, but here in BC, uh, we have the BC Support Unit, uh, and here on Vancouver Island, we're the, the local representation of SPOR, uh, so that's the Vancouver Island Regional Center, so uh, you've got at least one of us in, in each one of your centers, uh, or in each one of your sites here today. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Jenny. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about, thank you, <laughs> the benefits and the value of patient-oriented research, if we haven't already convinced you of what the value is going to be. So I'm sure most people have seen this, this is pretty common, the, the death valleys. So um, a lot of research basically starts out with lab tests um, and then goes towards testing on people and then hopefully gets into decision making and clinical practice. But between each of these steps, there's a valley where a lot of research just kind of disappears without a trace, either because it doesn't make it through the first lab testing or the tests on people, where you figure out that things aren't efficacious or you know there are lots of adverse experiences. Um, and there's only very small amounts of information that actually makes it into clinical practice. So along with the rising cost of healthcare and the sheer amount of evidence that's coming out these days, which healthcare providers and health system decision makers have to keep up with, there's a lot out there and most of it just doesn't get anywhere. So again, people have probably seen this stat, that it takes an average of 17 years for research evidence to actually get into clinical practice, and only about 14% of that evidence is actually going to make it, um, just because things are changing so quickly. So one of the things that can help is patient-oriented research, because the knowledge users, i.e. the patients and the community partners and the caregivers, can provide their input about what is important to them and actually help shape the project and the research and the outcome. Um, and so as you can see from this slide, uh, research will be con conducted in the areas that people actually value and that actually mean something to them. Um, and we often cite a study um, in, I think, the UK uh, looking at where the funding for osteoporosis research went, and about 80% of it went on uh, new drugs, um, clinical trials to look at the different types of drugs that could be helpful in osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. And actually, when, when they, the researchers talked to patients, they found overwhelmingly that what patients were really interested in was actually things that would improve their quality of life. So they didn't really mind whether they were on drug A, B, or C. What they actually wanted to know was, is this going to be able to help me walk a flight of stairs, go shopping, you know, brush my hair, those kinds of things. And the research really wasn't looking into that. Uh, that was kind of a side benefit, but really what it was was about drug A or drug B. Um, so patient-oriented research has the potential to improve outcomes because you're kind of focusing in more on what is really important to patients. So there's quite a bit of literature nowadays about patient engagement in health research. It's, become, it's becoming more of kind of the way that things are done. Um, PCORI in the US has been doing this kind of thing for a while. Um, and also, um, there are parallels between patient-oriented research and community-based research. They're very similar. Uh, patient-oriented research um, is what we're doing is focused on the healthcare system. Um, and, it, and it engages people at more of an individual level as opposed to the community. Um, and it focuses usually on kind of more clinical outcomes that are important to particular patients. Uh, so patient-oriented research isn't a new thing. It's, it's been around for a while, just under different names. Um, and so really there is a, a quite a lot of literature around benefits and challenges. So it, it sounds like a good thing, but obviously there are some reasons why it's hard to do. Um, so the benefits of patient-oriented research include obviously enhancing the quality and the relevance of research and the applicability of research. You're also empowering patients to support the implementation of findings in practice. So when people feel more connected to the literature, 
more connected to the outcomes, they think that it's personal to them or to somebody they know, they're much more likely to be able to champion that and try and get it into practice and kind of advocate for the, themselves rather than just being a passive recipient. Um, so you're, you're enabling research objectives and questions that are very user-focused and user-friendly. Um, you're engaging the patients in the interpretation of data and in the knowledge translation parts of it, which is great because ultimately those are the part of the people as well as clinicians who are going to actually need to use that. So if something comes out of the research in a form that is completely unintelligible to patients, they're not going to be able to use that. It's not going to be useful to them. So having them engaged you know, early on in the research is really useful for actually making sure that what comes out of it is in a form that can be useful to them, whether it's a one-pager or a play or you know, a, a video like we just saw. Um, patients probably are going to tell you what's, what they're going to watch and what they're going to read and what they're not. Um, it can also increase study enrollment rates. I know we were talking about patient-oriented research as you know, partners rather than being clinical subjects, but actually patients being involved in research themselves is really useful to engage other patients in that kind of thing. So rather than kind of going through different channels, you might be able to say, you know, are your friends interested in this? Do you know other people who will be interested in these? We need to talk to more people and, and kind of get that snowball effect of people just, you know, referring on. So those are some of the benefits. Of course, the challenges are that a lot of this is based on engagement and relationships, and so patient-oriented research takes more time in general because you can't just build that relationship immediately. You need to get to know the patients, the people with lived experience, what they need. They need to trust you. You need to trust them. You can't just put a, a load of people in a room and hope that that team will mesh together. Um, there's also a bit of a worry around tokenism that you know, people will tick a box that says, yep, I've engaged a patient in my research, and by including one or two people, I've covered the whole spectrum of people with this condition. Obviously, that's not the case. So we try and avoid the tokenism of that by having multiple patient partners with multiple perspectives. Um, people are used to managing their own research projects, especially in academia, where it's a publish or perish kind of mentality, or it has been. And so it's hard to relinquish some of those decisions to patients and say, OK, you know, what do you think we should look at, and how do you think we should study it? Not that those decisions are completely in the patient's hands. Obviously, they need the methodological help from, from academics and clinicians. But it, it is kind of a shift in thinking to move that away from just an academic standpoint and give some of the control to the patient. And then the last one is there's obviously tensions between the criteria for quality research and more uh, narrative or anecdotal or qualitative side of research. So obviously, for example, like a clinical trial is, is very standardized with everything very much. You know, it has to be like this, this, and this. And obviously, if you're bringing in a patient perspective into that kind of thing, and they're saying, well, why don't you change this, or I think you should be looking at this, there's some of that tension between wanting to make sure that your research is still high quality and replicable, but also including those viewpoints and engaging them. And usually, it's completely possible, but again, it takes a lot more work. So people have to be willing to put in the effort to actually get that thing going. So we're up to number two on the worksheet. So identify any benefits of patient-oriented research that make you want to introduce POR principles into your research or improve the way you do it already. So we'll give people a minute or two on that. Maybe somebody at one of the other sites will end up sharing as well. So we'll give you a couple of minutes.
All right, so does anybody want to give us their ideas at either of the other sites? Hi, it's Comox, we can go. Um, I put down that uh, it helps uh, the questions that are being explored be more meaningful and better targeted and focused on what really matters. Um, that it enables the findings to be reported in ways that are meaningful um, to patients and probably others as well um, and presented in innovative ways that might not be typical ways for research to be presented. Um, you mentioned also the increased interest and participation possibly from, from other people who might want to be in the study. And I really like just the idea that, it, that having the, um, the patient and the lived experience input will help me think more broadly and understand um, the, the questions and the issues that I think are the questions and issues, but, but ex really expanding my own knowledge and understanding as well. So mm -hmm. that's what I put down. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, Jub no. Jubilee, you're going, to answer, you're going to answer the next one, Jubilee, because we're going to be looking at you. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go on to the next portion of the presentation, which is about when and how to engage patient partners in research, and a bit of a discussion around some of the ethical and cultural competence considerations. So I'll hand it back to Tara. All right. Okay, so brace yourselves, because the slide that comes next is a little intense. Um, you don't have to read this entire thing. These slides will be available later if you would like to read this entire thing. Basically, the, the purpose of this ridiculous timeline is to show that there are many, many different places that um, patient partners can be involved in a research process. Um, so right from developing the research questions all the way through ethics to the very end when it comes to change in practice and that change management piece. So the takeaway from this is, is really just a, there are lots of different ways, depending on the study, depending on your patient partners, depending on your research team, um, where that lived experience perspective can inform uh, and really improve your project. Um, so some engagements for, uh, or some, pardon me, considerations for patient engagement. Uh, Jenny mentioned this a little bit earlier, but engaging as early as possible is really important. So um, the, the relationship piece and the trust piece um, of patient engagement is, is huge. And so, you know, you really want to avoid being a week before a grant deadline and saying, gosh, I think I need to talk to a patient partner because you're not really going to be able to have meaningful input at that point. Um, so start early um, and identify people with related lived experience. So whether that's going through community groups, uh, through clinics in the hospital, um, groups like the BC Support Unit can help you to identify people with lived experience. Um, with some groups, patient groups, it might be way easier to or, or more effective or simpler to talk to people who are caregivers or family members uh, but who can still provide that lived experience perspective as well. Um, it's really important to consider, and this sounds so intuitive, but um, to consider ability, skills, access, familiarity, and language. Um, so, you know, people come with uh, varying abilities. They come with skills outside of just being a patient. Nobody is just a patient in a vacuum. They have other, you know, life and career skills. Um, people have different access to technology, so some people might not be able to jump on a web conference if they don't have um, a computer. Um, familiarity and readiness for research, so some people will know a lot, some people will be brand new to research, so how you sort of um, build that relationship will depend on, uh, on your patient partner. Um, same with familiarity with health concepts and language should really be um, geared to be uh, approachable and something that's and accessible, so it's something that the entire team can, can feel like they're on the same page. Um, Jenny also mentioned uh, not expecting one person to speak for that entire patient group. Uh, so it's really important to consider the optimal number of patient partners. And this will usually be striking a balance between including enough different perspectives that your research is meaningful um, and also, you know, con um, including a, a number of people that's manageable for your research project. Um, so we try really hard to uh, suggest that people shy away from only having one patient partner, um, at least two, and, and maybe different patient partners at different stages in the research project as well. Um, communicating in plain language, again, it seems really obvious, but is really important, um, uh, depending on, um, or, and also letting patients know their role, uh, how much input they're going to be able to have, you know, will they be able to, to have veto power or is it mostly a consultative uh, approach? 
um, what is the, the commitment that you're asking from, from people, uh, how is communication going to work, and how is decision making going to work. So these are really important things to be really upfront with people in really plain language. Um, and then last but not least, to plan for patient orientation is really important as well. So um, we always suggest having one point person. Uh, so when you have patient partners on your team, having someone that they can go to uh, for questions and that person can orient them to even just how to call into a teleconference and how to be prepared for meetings and what are we going to ask of you and, um, and so that that person is really prepared for, for what they're, or how they're going to be able to participate. Uh, some ethical and cultural considerations. Uh, so just a brief note to say that there are lots of different considerations to take into account when you're planning. So things like safety, privacy, language and scheduling, uh, making sure that your patient partners feel valued, um, and ensuring that they have some real opportunities for input. Um, it's important to consider power dynamics. Uh, and the potential experience of stigma. So if you're a patient partner sitting around a table and everyone goes around and introduces themselves as Dr. So-and-so, um, by the time you get to that patient partner, they're maybe feeling like they don't have anything that they can contribute or they're not feeling comfortable speaking up and contributing in that. Um, so power dynamics are important. Um, and stigma and fear of consequences is important to consider as well. So if this person gives their opinion, are they safe to do so? Um, avoiding tokenism, again, is really, really important. Um, and considering potential barriers to participation is important as well. So um, physical barriers, can they actually get to where you're, where you're meeting? Um, cognitive barriers, emotional, logistical, and financial, I mean, especially if you're asking people to come to work nine to five, for example, you might consider holding your meetings in the evening or over a lunch hour somewhere close to where that person works, um, or, or just being mindful of those considerations. Um, and also being able to reimburse people for any out-of-pocket expenses. So no one should be out-of-pocket for um, participating in your project. Uh, we want to consider cultural norms around appropriate engagement and participation methods, depending on what kind of a community you're working with. Um, same with heterogeneity within cultural and ethnic communities. So that's, again, not having one person uh, and expecting them to speak for an entire group of people. Um, and as I alluded to, you want to consider patient partner compensation and or reimbursement of expenses. So reimbursement is making sure that you know, no one is out of pocket, so you're covering their parking or their gas or uh, child care if they have to pay for child care to come. Uh, compensation is really um, thanking people for their contributions. So they're two separate things and we recommend at least considering both and definitely uh, the reimbursement is absolutely key. So we'll jump into number three on your worksheet there. Uh, so what are some considerations that you can take into account when you next engage patients in your research? Uh, so we'll give you a couple of minutes for that one. All right, so it says I'm supposed to invite one person to share. I'm is somebody at the Jubilee Hospital. Would you like to share? Not to single you out or anything like that. No, but. not at all. <laughs> um, and since I'm the only one here, uh, so I actually do palliative and end of life care. So obviously, the patient themselves um, who is dying is will be difficult to engage for lots of reasons. They're dying. Um, their ability to commit, they're highly variable in terms of their ab ability to participate in, in much of anything. Um, and then the patient's families um, after their, or caregivers, after someone has passed, the question of how long do you wait to engage somebody and is their memory 
of their experience three months out, the same as their memory would have been in the moment? Are the things that were bothersome or good in the moment still something they can reflect on that far out? So how to actually um, get them involved in a useful and reliable way? I still am not sure how I would manage that. Thank you. Those are all really amazing considerations. And it's, it's so true. It's not a cut and dried thing. It's sticky and it's messy and it's um, important to do, but it's, it can be challenging. So thank you so much for raising all of those. Um, and I do hope it comes to cut in. I was going to say, and I guess also some of the answers to those questions may be talk to one of the patient partner's families to ask those questions to them to say, you know, it's been three months or it's been six months or when this happened two years ago, you know, do you think that your memories would have stayed the same or do you think that if somebody had approached you and said, like, would you be interested in taking part in research that you would have said, no, no, things are still too fresh or yes or so, so those questions could also be posed to somebody who's had those experiences and can look back on it and say, yeah, I think this and this would have worked and this wouldn't. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think one of the challenging things about patient-oriented research and one of the strengths of it is that um, it's okay to say, I don't know, and so I'm going to ask somebody who has the lived experience and does, uh, and that can be uh, difficult for some academics and clinicians to, to openly and freely admit that they don't know um, and they need some help, um, but it's a really, a really strong thing to bring in those perspectives to, to really have a, a well-informed um, project. Okay, so I'm going to turn it back over to Jenny here. All right. So discussion time. So we're going to have a pr probably fairly brief, since there aren't very many of us, uh, discussion, which is going to be informed by the worksheets. Um, so at the beginning, we were talking about patient-oriented research being defined as involving patients as partners and involving multidisciplinary teams and um, resulting in outcomes that are important to patients and improving those outcomes. So if you can think about a research project that you've either done in the past or doing now or are considering doing, is there any way that you can incorporate some of these principles or some of the patient perspectives into that research? And then how will you l apply what you've learned in the workshop? So setting a goal for yourself, whether that's I'm going to talk about how to incorporate patient partners into my work, or when I do my research, I'm going to get patient partner perspectives, or something like I would love to have a patient partner on my thesis defense because I think they would give a really valuable perspective that's not academic. So we'll give a couple of minutes for that and then we'll have a quick discussion about it and then we'll tell you about some of the tools and support that uh, we can provide you. So don't feel like you need all the answers to this because until you know what we can offer you then maybe you don't know some of these things. Um, but give it your best shot and we'll give it a couple of minutes and see what everybody comes up with.
Right. So I realize that there's only three of us. Well, <laughs> there's more facilitators than participants at the moment. But does anybody want to give an example? And also, if you have a question, feel and you feel like you want to ask us a question, you can always ask us something as well. Um, we will have some time at the end for questions. But does anybody want to uh, give an answer to number four or number five? We won't pick on the Jubilee this time if you don't want to. All right. Uh, for me, I'm doing a project right now that is on, that is, uses a patient-oriented research approach, looking at what are our best practices to engage marginalized communities in patient-oriented research. And we do have a patient partner as a co-lead on the project, but uh, she's got some barriers to participating, so she uh, hasn't met the whole team yet and hasn't been involved in our team meetings. So. Um, what I would want to apply based on what I've learned is to um, uh, find ways to overcome her barriers or um, I realize now that having only one patient partner is not ideal, so maybe finding other patient partners from different types of groups uh, to improve the diversity of the patient voices on the project and then um, engage them early with orientation and relationship building, even though we're working on very technical stuff right now, like a literature review and search protocol, which is all very academic, but I think um, now would be a good time to, for just relationship building and um, making sure that when we make major decisions about the research, uh, patients are involved at that point. Yeah. So my goal um, is would be, I have to check with my supervisor, but would be to like find a local patient partner here in Victoria that I could work on engaging because we're, we're distributed in a few different places. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, just to, to clarify, we're not always saying that just having one patient partner is like a no-no, depending on what you're looking at or, you know, if it's a very specific experience, it may be hard to find multiple people with that same experience, but it does, it, it kind of helps the patient partner if they don't feel like they're the only one as well because they, they may feel a sense of kind of, not duty exactly, but a responsibility. You know, if, if you're looking for lived experience from them, they may feel like, oh, I don't really know the answer to that question, but I'm the only one who they're looking to me for. So, you know, if I had another person here that, you know, we could kind of bounce ideas off, it, it's really, that that's kind of better. But we're not saying, you know, if you have one patient partner, you it's, it's not good research. It can be. Um, it's more of a comfort level thing. Some people are really happy being the only person with experience in the room, and some people really feel more comfortable if they have other people who they feel on the same level with, so it's very variable, but thank you. Does anybody else want to give an example? All right, we'll take that as a no. Is this you or me? It is you. It's me. Oh, it's me. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to give you a bit of an overview about um, the supports that we can provide through the BC Support Unit and some of the things that we do. Um, so I invite the, um, my colleagues in the other sites to jump in. So in Victoria at the Jubilee, we have Rebecca and Taylor. And uh, up in Comox, we have Uta. So we're the little team of five, and there we all are. Uh, so that's me on this side, and then Uta, and then Taylor, and then Rebecca, and then Tara at the end. Um, so the things we do, we do some patient engagement planning, um, which we work directly with the teams and with the patients. We have training, learning resources. Um, some of them are self-directed, and some of them we offer courses. We have support that we can provide with REDCap, which is one of the um, data capture platforms that we use. Um, which kind of allows research teams to um, keep all their information in one place in um, a supported environment. Island Health supports it, and I don't know if UVic does, but um, it's like a secure data repository. We can help with that. Um, and it can be really easily manipulated and set up, and it can involve surveys, and people can fill out you know, whatever they want. Uh, we have resources and training around knowledge translation. We do support with research methods. We do consult, it says consultation on pragmatic clinical trials. I would like to say that this is something that we have not really been involved in and that we would have a lot of learning to do around pragmatic clinical trials, but 
we know people who can talk to you about pragmatic clinical trials. It's not really our thing. Um, we can do letters of support for research proposals. So a lot of what we do is um, looking for money for granting teams and helping them trying to get there um, and get that money going. And then we have electronic communities of practice as well um, online. So that's kind of just a meeting place for people to come together um, and talk about whatever. So again, we can set those up for teams where everybody can kind of log on and then there's bulletin boards and you know discussion forums and that kind of thing. Um, so I don't know if Taylor at the other side, do you want to give a brief overview of kind of what you do? And then we'll kind of do a little round. I don't think we've actually got a thing about what No, we do I didn't here. dive. Okay. Yeah, we don't dive into sort of what each of our roles are. Okay. <laughs> so just to say that Taylor is the patient research liaison, so that's her role. Tara and Uta are research navigators, so more of what they do is kind of that upfront uh, finding, getting teams together, finding grants, helping with that kind of thing. Taylor's role is to really uh, match make between the teams and the patient partners and really support the patient partners throughout the research project. And my role as a knowledge broker is kind of to do either the front end stuff with literature reviews and that kind of thing, or the back end stuff with the knowledge translation and making sure that things actually get into practice. And Rebecca is our fearless leader, yes. Um, so some of the work that we've done to date, um, we've got about $2.2 million of projects going. So we've been going for two years, and the first year was operational. So we've got two more years left in our five-year cycle of funding, and uh, we're going to be receiving another five-year cycle of funding, hopefully, uh, almost certainly. Uh, so we've got 13 projects funded, um, six are awaiting decisions, and nine have been unsuccessful. So our success rate with helping with projects is about 60%, which is pretty good. And we support anything to do with health. So we've supported projects around mental health, substance use, dementia, trans health, chronic pain, multiple sclerosis, fear of childbirth, experiences of cancer, and recurrent C. diff. And those are the ones that have been funded. So some of the ones that are waiting on decisions have been more in the kind of bench science area, which um, is interesting because a lot of the um, the kind of basic sciences and the engineering disciplines and computing it's kind of hard when you first think about it to work out where people might get in to work with a patient partner in those areas. Um, but we've actually got um, a patient partner working with somebody here at UVic um, on um, uh, biomarkers of depression. And it's a very kind of lab-based project. But she is all over that one and loving it. We've got um, an application that's gone in around um, engineering and reverse total shoulder arthroplasty and working with patient partners to make that kind of shoulder replacement surgery really personalized so that pa patients have better outcomes so that it's not just a kind of standardized procedure. You really work with the patient to work out what is going to be useful for them um, and how, how their outcomes are going to be. Um, and then we've got a couple of projects going around kind of health technology, informatics, assistive devices for people with disabilities. So, so all of those areas may not initially look as though they're health, but actually everything is to do with health, so we can help with you know, a ton of things. So we do have um, a website that is the BC support unit in general across BC. Um, so there is an inquiry form button there. So if you do have an inquiry, feel free to click that and fill out the short survey, and we'll get back to you. But we really just encourage people just to email us because it's a lot easier and it's more direct. And instead of it being a kind of formal inquiry form, we can always do the formal form later. But it's much easier to just have a conversation around what you think you might want and the support that you might want. And then we can say yes or no, or you know, we can des we can definitely help you with that. We can fill out forms later, so don't be put off about filling in a form. Um, and the other thing that's quite useful on the website is the resources tab. Um, so they, they've um, structured this in terms of um, different resources for different groups. So you can either look at all the resources that we have on there, or you can say, I'm interested in resources for patients, and it will sort everything by just the patient resources or clinicians, or you know, I'm only interested in webinars, and, and it will show you those. So that's a good tab to go to. Um, and then the electronic communities of practice, if anybody's interested in that. There's a Become a Member button where um, you can join up. It will give you access to the communities of practice. And then if you have a team of people that you want to connect with, you can get them to join up and 
put everybody in a group and it just provides like an online forum. Um, you can post discussions or whatever on there. It's just kind of a way to connect people if they can't connect in person. So, does anybody have any questions? Since we've now talked at you for 50 minutes, and there's only three of you, so you probably feel like, oh my god. So does anybody have any questions that we can answer? And we can always talk to people afterwards if people don't want their questions on camera as well. All right, did anybody think that we have not met the learning objective? There is a form for this. So there is an evaluation survey. Um, if you could fill that in, that would be great. But if there is anything on here that you feel like we have not explained, please do let us know because we want everybody to be clear and we don't want to complicate things. So if there are no questions, then everybody can fill out the evaluation survey and talk amongst yourselves at the site. And thank you very much for being here. You three people. <laughs> you keeners. Good on you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye.